Welcome to your College Bound Kid. A podcast for parents and families everywhere. Whether you have kids that plan to attend college or you have current college students, you want them in and you want them to graduate. You want a quality education that prepares you for the jobs available now and the jobs available 30 years from now. I am Mark Stucker, and I'm a college coach. And I am Anika Madden, and I'm a parent. It is Thursday, September 26th, and welcome to episode number 87, How Do Admissions Committees Make Decisions? In this week's news, surge in number of colleges cutting tuition, and we're in chapter 87. Did I say that to you? Yeah, you've been struggling with that tuition (laughs) word lately. (laughs) Got a tongue twister for Anika. Got a tongue twister for Anika. And we're in chapter 87 of 171 Answers, and we're discussing how admissions committees make decisions. And this week's question is from a mom about age consent for younger kids attending college. And Mark continues his interview with Ms. Tara Colonesian, admissions officer at Smith College, and what you need to know about college fairs and in college admission interviews. Okay, friends, several announcements today. The first is Anika and I want to give a real shout out to Dave. Vizia. Dave is our new sound engineer, and he is a real pro. For seven years, he was a sound engineer to one of my favorite podcasts, one of the most listened to podcasts in the country. And so we hired him. And for the last two months, he has been totally on point, have not found a single mistake. So no pressure out there, Dave. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but just want to give him job. a shout. Yeah, great job. <laughs> and if anyone is looking for a sound engineer for any audio project or a podcast, you can get Dave's email right off of our website. If you just go to yourcollegebrownkid.com, go to the About Us section, and then you'll see a Meet the Team link. And so he's fantastic. Secondly, for our admission tip, and Anika, I'm not sure if you have done this yet, but do you remember when... Jalen applied to college, how you had to have an FSA ID. hmm I do. Yes. The student and the parent need an FSA ID. Mm-hmm. And the FSA ID serves as your electronic signature that you will use to sign the FAFSA. And mm-hmm. it has opened up now in September. And so we'll put a link in the show notes. But if you're planning on applying for financial aid, you need to complete the FAFSA. And there are some schools that don't even give a merit aid away unless a student completes the FAFSA. So FAFSA opens up October 1, but get your FSA ID. Have you got one? Do you think that uh, Janae has done hers yet? Probably. <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> She's we on her meet game. next week. <laughs> She's on her game. Okay. She'll well, tell you, me next Thursday. <laughs> so, so, do you remember where yours is from Jalen? You know I'm the foul queen. I got you something are. stashed away in an email or something somewhere. You do. <laughs> so you're good. All right. Well, for you rising seniors and parents of rising seniors who do not know anything about that, great time to get your FSA ID. And for admissions vernacular, our term is need conscious admissions. Need conscious admissions. I had an admissions officer use that term a couple of days ago in a presentation. Any idea what that is, Anika? Me conscious. Um, is it from the perspective of the admissions officer? Like, I know you need money, so I'm going to try my best to help you out? Or <laughs> I don't know. No, no. So, cl- no, not close. <laughs> <laughs> but I respect you for trying. <laughs> well, thank you. And so sometimes you just go like, Mark, you wanted to answer. And throw it back mm-hmm. in. So need conscious admission is really a synonym for need aware or need sensitive. And basically what that means is that the school looks at your ability to pay when they make some admissions decisions. It doesn't mean every admissions decision they make, they're looking at your ability to pay. But for some Mm. of the admissions decisions, you may not get in because you can't pay enough. So it's the opposite of need blind, which is not looking at, like completely keeps the financial aid process separate from the admission process. Was that clear or confusing? No, that was very clear and tough, man. Jeez, can't stand it. Stuff is complex, right? It always comes back to the money. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Always comes back to the money. For our college spotlight later, we will be going back to the West Coast. We've already done Stanford and San Francisco, and we will be talking about one of my favorite schools, Occidental College in Los Angeles. And finally, for our Your College Bound Kids survey, thank you so much. You all stepped up to the plate. We had quite a few surveys come in this week. 
And Anika and I value your time. We talked about this in our pre-planning meeting. We're going to do a little incentive for anyone who completes our Your College Bound Kids survey. First of all, we're going to send you the summary report in February of 2020. It'll be our two-year anniversary of the show. And we'll let you see the detail. Now, there are no names on these, so no, 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 I'm not going to show any emails or names, but you'll see a summary report. So if you're curious who our listeners are and what they like, you'll get the summary report if you complete our survey. And also, I am revising my ebook, my ebook that has my favorite admissions quotes. It has 33 quotes before. I'm revising it. And it's a lot bigger, and we'll send out the new revised version. So a couple little perks there to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm-hmm. Any thoughts, Anita? And, well, are they getting it if, they still, if they've already completed the survey? You're backtracking, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good catch. Good thanks for looking out for all the people who already completed it. Yeah, this is for anyone past or future who completes our survey through February. Yeah, y'all. You can find our Your College Bound Kids survey by going to yourcollegeboundkid.com click the About Us button, you will see a link to our survey. Thank you. Let's turn to college hot topics in the news. All right, Mark, this week's article entitled Surge in Number of Colleges Cutting Tuition. And this is found on saveforcollege.com written pretty recently by Mr. Mark Kantrowitz. I think I said that right. Mm -hmm. So first, Mark, I'm going to start with a definition of what he calls a tuition reset uh, that Mr. Kantrowitz provides, and that is a one-time reduction in a college's tuition rate, usually accompanied by a cut in financial aid. So keep in mind this tuition reset is what colleges do to cut their costs. Like that's what it's called. So apparently this picked up what do you say, between 2012 through 2018. And many of the colleges that were cutting the tuition, they were um, found to be mostly non-selective, small schools with enrollment, pretty small enrollment, under 5,000 students. And the majority were also private four-year colleges who mostly recruited their students regionally because they weren't well-known across the country. So Cantrell Witts writes that a tuition reset might not be a good fit for college's strategic goals, but it's always a good thing for us families, right? So, Mark, tell me what you thought of the article, but also, would you suggest that students who want to attend, you know, these schools that were doing it were these small private schools. So any family that wants to go to these larger institutions, should we not be holding our breath anytime for these tuition resets anytime in the near future? Okay, so there's a lot in there that you said, and I want to comment on a few things. First of all, got to give a shout out to Mark Kantrowitz. I've been singing his praises all the way back to my video series that came out in 2014 where I called him the most knowledgeable person I know of in the world when it comes to college finances and money, and someone who I personally think of as having mentored me just because I've basically read everything he's ever written that I can get my hands on. And one of an exciting time for me was getting to spend some time with Mark in person in November of last year, and he's agreed to come on the show. So Mm. I've been waiting. He's got a new book coming out. I've been waiting for his book to come out, but you will be hearing Mark Kentrowitz in 2020 with all of his brilliance about money. So I had to just give him a shout out, not because he has my name, but because he's Mark Kantrowitz. He's the man. <laughs> well, you know, when I read his name, I was like, where do I know that name from? I guess that's where it's from back in the day when you were, you know, citing him so much. So, okay. Oh, yeah. I talked about him you know. so much in my Game Changer video series. I really did. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> so well, I had to give him a shout out. <laughs> I had to give him a shout out, but I also, I want to correct a couple things you said, Anika, when talking about tuition resets. Because okay. you said something about Tuition resets are what colleges do when they want to. I don't actually. I don't want to misquote you. You said something about cut their costs. Didn't you say cut their costs? No, 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 no. It's like okay, so they were cutting their, the cost of their tuition, and then so the term used to cut the tuition was a, a tuition reset. At least that's what I thought he was saying. I could be totally wrong. Yeah. So let me first of all define a tuition reset a little different than the way you explained it. Okay. And then tell you my thoughts about it. And you said she'll be holding our breath for these larger schools to do it. So let me just get right to the bottom line. A tuition reset doesn't mean that you as a consumer pay any less money. You're not paying less money with a tuition reset. So, Mm -hmm. you know, and I know you think, well, that doesn't make sense because it's reducing the cost of tuition. So why would I not pay less money? 
So what a tuition reset involves is colleges were working off of a particular model. And the model had to do with charging you, having a sticker price, which remember, that's your list price, right? Your sticker price. Mm -hmm. That was substantially more than anybody was actually paying. And then what they would do is they would give people huge merit scholarships. So, for example, let's say a private school list is costed $60,000, okay? But then nobody paid $60,000. Nobody, like, you know, 90 plus percent of people were getting five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand $20,000 scholarships. And so everybody, even the people that are paying the most, were paying 30s or 40. Okay? That's what was happening before. And now these schools that are doing tuition resets, what they're doing is they're lowering their costs, but they're getting rid of that scholarship. So people are not paying less money than they paid before. Mm. So, you know, here's a quote on what a tuition reset is a one-time reduction, which you said in college tuition, usually, look at this, usually accompanied by a cut in financial aid. Mm -hmm. So you used to get that, you know, that scholarship money. Now you don't get it. So the college's net price usually does not decrease by much. Remember, net price is what you actually pay. Sticker price is list price. I always use, you know, I always use this dress. You may remember this from my video series. And do you remember me saying, if you go into Nordstrom's and the dress says $159 and there's a line through it and it's actually $49, then you don't really care that it was $159. All you care about is $49. Right. I don't know if you remember that. It was in there. But no, but that was five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll give you a mulligan. So net price is what you actually play. And that's all you really care about. Net price is the sticker price minus free money. So what tuition resets are doing is it would be like basically instead of doing that 159 through the dress, line through it, you pay 49. Okay. It'd be like saying, no, it's 49.99 right now. And that's the list price. And that's what it is. So it's getting rid of that inflated price. And it's also getting rid of the scholarship. Does that make any sense or not? Mm -hmm, it does. Thank you. Okay. So this is fascinating. Just to go back to some of the research he revealed in the article, this is a totally fascinating article. So what Kantrich did, and he has all these great charts in that, and we'll put the link to this article so you guys can read it. This is one you really want to read. And by the way, super shout out to a couple people. Can't remember all of them. I remember Grant Gardner was one from Colorado, but several people forwarded this article to us and that's how it ends up being on the show today, because it was a great article. So once again, thank you guys for sending us these great articles. Mm -hmm. So what Kendra just did, he looked at the cost of college to see how many schools actually did tuition resets. And from 1987 to 1995, so you're talking about, you know, a whole eight to nine year period. There's only one school that did a tuition reset. One. Okay, it's crazy. One. But then he notices that around, it's been increasingly creeping up ever since 1996. And so he points out how the average number of schools that have done a tuition reset more recently from 2012 have been 10 a year. So it went from one over eight, eight and a half years to an average of 10. And then in 2018, there were 18 of them. So this is totally on the rise. So, Anik, a lot of times colleges have really tough decisions to make. A lot of times they have a binary choice between two completely different philosophies, and you can make a viable debate for either one. And ferocious debates occur within admissions offices over these different policies. One example is, do we give our money away on the basis of need, or do we give our money away on the basis of merit? That's a hot to potato topic, because there's only one pot of money. And you either give it away because a family has a need, they lack the income and assets to pay for the school. Or you give it away because somebody's bringing some talent that you really want and you feel they're going to help make your school stronger, whether they have a need or not. That's one of those huge things. Another one is, do we make a major, put a major emphasis on test scores or do we go test optional? Another one is what we talked about earlier. Are we going to be need blind in our admissions, meaning we're going to make admissions decisions without looking at the ability to pay or are we going to be need conscious? So these are some examples, and there are many more, but we don't need to talk about them in this podcast. But this is a huge one. And this one breaks down this way. There's arguments on both sides. So I'll kind of go over these arguments and tell me which argument you think is stronger. Okay. Argument number one says, 
that it's just human nature that if something is more expensive, people think it's better. They just do. So if they see whatever, two cars, one costs more than the other one, they think it's better. And if it, the cost is too low, if you're looking at hotel rooms, then you might think, what's wrong with that place? Why is it so cheap? There's a human tendency to think that what something that costs more is better. Colleges are aware of that. So what they do is they have these super inflated costs. So they may say they may list their prices as 60000 And knowing full well that they're not even expecting anybody to pay anywhere close to that, give everybody ten dollars to $20,000 scholarship. They feel great. They feel the honor of having the scholarship conferred on them. And the college gets like $40,000. And people think the school was better because they listed it as 60000 They feel like they got a bargain and they got a deal. Whereas if they would have come in and said we're 30000 people would have been like, mm, why are you 30 and the other school is 60? Mm. So just in general, do you see like, do you understand that rationale? Does that sort of make sense from a human nature standpoint? Uh, yeah, of course, because in some cases you do pay for what you get, right? So maybe, maybe not. I guess it's a gamble in some of these cases. Right. Yeah. And this is something that I've really wrestled with, uh, because I try really hard with my practice to keep my costs down. And I have had many people over the years tell me things like, you need to increase your prices mm -hmm. just because people are not going to think you're that good if you're priced a lot less than other people that, you know, that you're competing against. I haven't had somebody for a while that said, I can get you a lot of business in New York, someone I worked with, but you got to increase your prices. I'm just telling you that right now mm -hmm. because they're not going to think you're very good. They're going to wonder, why are your prices lower than the New York market? Are you like cheaper or something? Like, what's the deal? And I had somebody this summer that said that to me, like, why are you like half the price of the other person I'm looking at? Like, what's up with that? So I know for a fact that there's some truth to that. All right. So that's part of why colleges would go for this high tuition, what is called a high tuition, high discount model. So you have a high price, but then you're giving everybody a big tuition discount. So that was the prevailing wisdom all the way up really through about, you know, in the mid 90s, right? Now, here's the other argument. And this is the tuition reset argument. If your price is too high, people are not even going to set foot on your campus. And I see that played out every day. I did a session this morning at 1130 and a family said to me, oh, that school is extremely expensive. Why are you, I don't know why you're recommending that one to us. I don't know if we can afford it. And I had somebody the day before say something very similar to that. So that argument is that if you price yourself so high, you won't even give people a chance to set foot on your campus to visit. Because they'll just say, oh, I don't know if I can afford it. And therefore, that hurts you. So do you see ration wisdom to that line of art? Yeah, but I mean, you can't cater to everybody, right? So it's got to be, it seems to me that they got to focus on who their target is. Who's their target audience? But the, here's the thing. Different people think differently. There are some people that, let's say your goal is to get $35,000. you would be thrilled if you could get $35,000 for a family. Mm -hmm. There are some people that if you list your school at 60, and give away all this merit money so that you're actually getting about 30, 35, they'll feel great. They'll feel like, oh, the school is good. It was originally listed at 60. Oh my goodness, look at the bargain I got. Mm -hmm. And everybody will be happy. They'll feel your, your quality because gee, you're around the same price as some of the other schools I respect. And you didn't charge me that. And so there's wisdom there, mm -hmm. but there's also wisdom to the other approach. Some people say 60. I don't have 60. I'm not visiting. So it's really not a case of right or wrong. It's just different buyer psychology. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it does. And so the reason why the tuition reset is growing is more and more and more schools are saying to themselves that we are not even getting people on our campus anymore. They're either saying, I don't have that money, or they're saying, you don't have enough prestige to justify me paying that much money for you. I have families all the time that tell me, I'll pay 70000 for this school, but I'm not paying like even close to that for this school over here. Mm. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah. So what Cantor does in this article is he looks at the characteristics of all of these schools that have been doing tuition resets. And some of the things he says that at least 90% of kids are getting financial aid. In other words, they're doing heavy tuition discounting. Almost nobody's paying the sticker price for these schools. Their average grant in each income quartile is at least 25% of tuition. In other words, they're having to give money away to everybody just to get them to come. They're basically bribing families with merit scholarships to come is what they're doing across the board. 
And he noticed that they have, they have a very high acceptance rate. They also have a low yield, meaning they have to make a lot of offers to get somebody to enroll. Mm -hmm. And then he lists some other things as well that are characteristics of all of these schools. And then what he says is, you know what? There were 18 colleges that did tuition resets this last year, but there's 273 more of these private, not-for-profit, four-year schools, because almost every one of these schools, by the way, that did this tuition reset, they were private, not-for-profit, four-year schools that have little name recognition outside of their immediate area, and they have to make a lot of offers to get somebody to come, and they have to heavily discount them. He says there's 273 more schools like this. So don't think you're seeing the end of this tuition resetting because there's probably a whole lot more of it coming down the future. So what do you think about anything I said? Because I've been talking a long time. Well, I feel like it's just a psychology game because to your point, it's not really making a difference in what you're coming out of pocket. I don't guess. So why does it matter to us that they're discounting the tuition? I mean, if they're taking off the sticker price, like what difference does that make? Outside of our psyche. Well, one of the reasons why it matters is because what we're explaining is not what everybody knows. So the average person in the public thinks, oh, my goodness. They think of it almost like a sale. Like a, they almost think like, oh, the college is having a Black Friday. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So remember how initially I felt you described it in a way where you felt people were paying less? Mm-hmm. That's what the public thinks. So it's important that we explain to people that this tuition resetting doesn't mean you're paying less money to go to college. Now, don't get me wrong. They don't present it that way, Anika. The, when right. schools roll out tuition resets, they roll it out like, look at our, they roll it out almost like it's a Black Friday special, right? Like, <laughs> you're going to love, we, we like, no, they do. They're like, great news, everybody. We've heard Ooh. your complaints that we're charging too much. So guess what? We've listened to you and we're lowering our prices. So they don't, they don't say, guess what? You know, when we said we were 60, well, nobody was really paying that anyway, because we had to bribe everybody with merit scholarships or you weren't going to come. Oh, we're reading your minds now. <laughs> yeah. So, so one of the reasons we're discussing this article is to let people know that when they see tuition resetting going on, and that's the technical name, right? The average public will just think of it as, well, they slash their prices. Mm-hmm. And one thing Catcher, which does in this article is he shows the average amount of tuition reset. And they're all over the place. Like, sure, there are people that, you know, just like slashed it by like, well, I have it right here. So there are a couple of schools that did zero to 4%, a couple that did five to nine. This is like, you know, percentage. Some did a decent chunk did 10 to 15. Quite a bit did 15 to 35% reduction. That was the largest amount between 15 to 35. And Anika, two of them did over 50% and one did over 60. Oh, literally slash wow. 60%. Yes. So the point is, don't go for the funk and don't believe that all of a sudden somebody's being super magnanimous and generous by like slashing their prices because all they're going to do is not have financial aid for you anymore. And and they're moving away from what we call a high tuition, high discount model to uh, this is our bare bones price. This is what we actually need to get and don't expect to get scholarship money from us. Gotcha. Any other comments, thoughts? Mm-mm, no, it was all a trick. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for confusing me. <laughs> I mean, like you said, it's all good. Now we know. Now we know. Now we know. Now it's time for our step-by-step walkthrough of the college admissions process. Okay, friends, we are up to our 87th episode, which means it's the 87th chapter in a book that I wrote. And today we're looking at a a pretty complex question, which is how do admissions committees actually make decisions? Like, what is the process from your file being completed and submitted? Now, we don't get into like it goes to the, you know, administrative assistant and she logs something in the computer or blah, blah. We're not like getting into that. But, you know, when an application is at an admissions committee. Like, how do they decide who gets in and who doesn't? Anika, you've read the chapter. What are your thoughts? Well, to begin, there were so many different approaches. I was like, whoa, like, <laughs> wait a minute. I know. <laughs> I know. But I know. And I don't want to go through all those because it was just like, oh, my goodness gracious, it's too much. But 
The, but I'm going to tell you the biggest thought that jumped in my mind came after you mentioned your experience on a committee where you were saying that you had to make sure that your committee member, like it was a diverse committee, like you had to make sure that there were diff- people from different races, cultures, social economic backgrounds, interests to, you know, the balance, the biases that would have come out of, you know, whoever is looking at those applications. So mm-hmm. my thought is, man, these schools should be held accountable for how diverse their committees are. Are they? I mean, I feel like that could be something that could be governed, maybe even on a state level. So that was interesting. And then, you know, you going into the UPN's, their, I guess, method or evaluation method. The, I think it was the committee-based evaluation. Where, Correct. CBE. Yeah, where you have two readers for an application, which actually seems like common sense. Seems like all of them should have been doing that to begin with. Granted, it takes more time, but you are also choosing to review applications. So you need to do it in the most balanced way possible, I would imagine. And so before, Mark, you're saying that going back to all those different approaches, like maybe one person was making the call or, you know, either the territory person or the VP of enrollment. It was just like, woof, it was just all over the place. But are people, I guess you can help me by understanding, are people now doing this committee based evaluation more so as opposed to just being so one sided or lopsided or however they are? Boy, you always ask deep questions, you know. So sorry. (laughs) No, it's okay. It brings out truth. (laughs) <laughs> so, first of all, I actually do want to read a, a little section, and your head may be spinning from all the different methods, but I want people to see how many different approaches are. So, this is something I say in the book. I say there are so many different rating systems out there that I can't list them all, and candidly, I don't even know them all. At some colleges, everybody goes to committee. At other colleges, nobody goes to committee. At some colleges, the territory manager, also known as the regional rep, has the most weight in the decision because they know the schools and they've possibly interacted with the applicant the most. At many schools, the dean of admission or the VP of enrollment makes the final decisions. At many other schools, committee members vote. And whoever, the majority, like, you know, if it's a vote and six people say yes, three say no, then majority rules. At other colleges, the committee has to reach consensus as opposed to voting. Then I say at some colleges, there's an extra reader who is not on the admission staff and is not the regional rep but they may serve as the first reader. Some colleges have like seasonal readers, people they hire just to read extra files because the file reading is so heavy, but they don't travel, they don't go to fairs, they don't recruit students, they don't manage a territory. And then I say at some students, the territory manager, the regional rep, presents the applicant to the admissions committee, and at other schools, a senior member of the staff is the initiator. So I know that was a lot, and I don't expect people to process all that. Your head is probably spinning because mine is. Uh You know it. Like the point is, there's no one standard way in which committees make decisions. And that's all I really want people to take away from that. But Mm -hmm. to follow up, and I was going to do a whole episode on CB, but I do talk about it here. So let me just touch on it. So, and remember, of course, so many schools are just doing admissions by the numbers, right? They're crunching numbers. They're looking at test scores. They're looking at courses and they're looking at GPA. So we're not talking about that. These are schools that do holistic admissions. So let's just first say that because so many schools are using some type of freshman index and just crunching numbers and using a grid model to make decisions. So that's a whole other model, but we've talked about that a lot in the past. Those schools oftentimes have processors at the back. And what happens for those schools is the admission person that's out on the road recruiting, they're drumming up applications, but they have nothing to do with decisions. They have processors at the back that are just running numbers and seeing whether or not you have the numbers and you're getting in. So That's extremely common, by the way. So let's say that. But for schools that do holistic admissions, one thing that tends to be pretty common is that the territory manager or the regional rep, who is the one that has your area or has a certain geographic area, they tend to have a pretty big say in the decision-making process. That is a pretty common model. The thinking is they travel, they know the school, they may have met the student on the road, they might have even interviewed the student. They have a big say over who gets in. And so one thing that emerged in 2013 at the University of Pennsylvania, also with some help from Swarthmore College, is a whole new method to file reading called committee-based evaluation. Now, one thing that has to be said about committee-based evaluation, Anika, is one of the biggest reasons originally for having committee-based evaluation is it was just taking colleges too much time to read all these files. Like we know we've talked a lot about applications keep growing, 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 right? And schools, they keep getting more and more. Mm -hmm. And so colleges said, look, we just don't have the money to double our admission staff. 
So they said, there's got to be a way that we can read these files faster. And also what happens is admission officers were burning out. They were like, reading season for some people is terrible. You know, like long 12, 14 hour days, like reading file after file. And it was just too much. And they were quitting. And so they said, okay, is there a way that we can maintain more work-life balance, give people an actual nine to five during reading season, not burn them out without decreasing our quality? And so that's when this idea was birthed at Penn. Shout out to Ms. De Silva for her brilliance in coming up with this. Yvonne Romera De Silva is now at Rice, by the way. And what she said is, well, what about if two people read together and a lot of advantages come from that? One person can check each other's person's biases because one of the problems with relying on the regional manager is that things were getting filtered through their bias. And we've talked a lot about how biases impact decisions. I won't go over that. So we have someone to put a check and balance on your bias. That's really, really good. And one person focuses on the academic components of the application. So you're talking about things like the school profile and, of course, the transcript and, of course, the counselor recommendations and the teacher recommendations and the test scores. So one reader, usually the territory manager, focuses on the academic side. And then the other reader focuses more on sort of like the character side. And that person's looking at things like, you know, extracurriculars, an interview, if there's an interview note in the file, and they're looking at outside recommendations, things like that. And so the idea is that there'll be a check and balance on each other. Sometimes they are referred to as the pilot and the co-pilot in committee-based evaluation. So another advantage to the CBE, Anika, is it can be a great onboarding process, meaning that when new uh, admission officers are hired, you can pair them up an experience rep and they can learn from seeing that person in action. But the idea is that the two people talk through the application up front, they check each other's checks and balances, and one person oftentimes getting trained from the experience of another person. But here's the other advantage to it from an admissions committee standpoint is that the idea is that they pretty quickly rule out non-competitive applicants and they blow through them really fast and only the serious people go to committee. And so the people that have a chance of being, of getting in, get discussed at committee. And so they blow through their nose really fast and get to the people that are under consideration and the, the committee time, more committee time is actually spent on people that have a chance. I don't know. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. It does. Yeah. So the one thing I want to say though, CBE is still controversial. Not everybody likes it. Ooh, really? Yeah. Well, one, one of the reasons why some people don't like it is, so there were committees, Anika, where every single file was getting two full reads. So with CBE, one person is reading the academic portion and another person's reading like the character extracurricular portion of stuff. And so some people feel like no one person sees the whole big picture. And then other people mm -hmm. feel like some people are just making an excuse to find out how to get through a file really, really quickly. Because one of the purposes of this was to get through files quicker to reduce the amount of reading time. Mm -hmm. And so some people feel like not as much time is being taken. So I don't want to make it too complex and too detailed, but the bottom line, and this is not supposed to be a whole podcast on CBE, but the idea is there are so many different ways in which admissions officers read files, but everybody is trying their best to make a fair decision as much as they can. But it is a human process mm -hmm. and it's still with human process it's just like hiring for a job. Right. If you go through the process of hiring, human bias creeps in and you might have all the procedures in place with your HR. It's still not going to be perfect. Right. But I have profound respect for the extent to which schools go to great lengths to try to get it right. Anika and I are so grateful for everyone who has financially supported our podcast. It allows us to pay our staff and cover our other auxiliary expenses involved in having a weekly professional podcast. At the start of every month, we're going to start sending a special gift to anyone who financially supports your college-bound kid. I will be sending our donors this bonus content once a month directly to your email. The bonus content will be between 10 to 15 minutes in length. Usually it will be a college-related topic that I'm passionate about. Occasionally, it'll be another bonus hot topic in the news segment. Sometimes it'll be an answer to a question that one of our 
listeners submits to us via email. And you'll receive these monthly audio blogs for a gift of any amount. We know that 5000 to one person is $5 to someone else. And we don't want your budget to be a hindrance to you receiving this additional bonus content. So if you want to support our show, just go to yourcollegeboundkid.com and click the donate button. And if you've already financially supported our podcast, you will automatically start receiving this bonus content via your email. This bonus content is our way of letting our financial supporters know in a tangible way how much we appreciate you. And if you have any questions at all about our monthly bonus content, just send your questions our way. That's to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Once again, questions at your collegeboundkid.com. So, Mark, is it a fair question for a student to ask who's going to be reviewing my application? Like, OK, so if you're interviewing for a job, they say, OK, you're going to be with the HR, you're going to meet with the Brown team, you're going to meet with operations, you're going to meet with this. And is that a fair question to say, I want to know who's reading my application? You know, Anika, I, I'm really getting to know you because in my preparation for this episode, I said, <laughs> Anika's going to ask this question. No, you didn't. She's going to say, should a student <laughs> ask the admission officer? So what method of evaluation do you use to determine if I get yeah, in? Do I you mean, use CBE? Do you use single, you know, single auto denial? You know, is it is it a vote? Is it consent? So this is my thinking on this. Mm -hmm. I don't recommend that you ask that. Why not? Well, the reason is because sometimes some schools see their process as kind of personal. It's not quite like asking somebody, like, how much do you weigh or how old are you? All right. But it, some people could interpret it as, is it kind of personal? Like our system is our system and we don't necessarily always reveal that. That's partly why I wouldn't ask it. And then partly yeah. an admission officer they're not going to necessarily feel like that is going to reveal that much to them about their school. And they're sort of like, you, you get a certain opportunity to ask so many questions. It's going to be more in your best interest to ask questions either about the character of the school, or the culture of the school, or where the school's going, or, you know, other things. So I just don't recommend it. It's not like it's a major taboo, hmm. but... To be honest, it will depend a little bit on how transparent the admission office is to officer is really. Yeah, I was just going to say which it should be anyway, right? Yeah, like, I mean, you know how some people in general are just more open about their lives and some people are more guarded? Mm -hmm. And that I think some admission officers would be interested in that. They would be open to it. But I think mm -hmm. it's a bit risky. You know, it kind of reminds me, I was meeting, and normally schools are a lot more transparent with me than they will be with the public. Mm -hmm. But it reminds me of when I was meeting with the senior financial aid administrator re recently and I asked them a question and they just kind of gave me one of those blow off like, OK, Mark, you're hitting a little bit too home on our money. You know, like, mm. yeah, we kind of do it sort of like that. And I kind of took the signal like, all right, this is like really personal and you don't want to like tell me your inside trade secrets. Mm. Well, I mean, I get it. Don't do it. But it doesn't make it right <laughs> in my mind, of course. Well, I really don't want to overstate this. There are some people that might be impressed that a student even knows this stuff, to be honest. Well, no, I, but no, 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 no. I wouldn't expect the child to go and be like, are you doing the CBE? Are you doing the IE3? Or, you know, I don't, I don't know. Alphabet soup. I don't Alphabet soup. Them. Right. No, no, no. That's not the idea is that they're trying to impress them with the lingo or to know what methods are being used. We just want to know in general, hey, what are you doing with my little life in your hands? I mean... I'm just curious to know, like, how do you evaluate your applicants? So I think it would be really similar to you go through it. You, you apply for a job, right? Mm -hmm. And then you say, so do you make the decision? Does everybody vote in the office? Do you make a referral? And then the owner of the company comes in and, and makes a decision. It's just not that anything's wrong with that, but there are going to be some people that may be like, you know, we kind of have our own ways. And I don't know. I don't know if that helped at all, but did it help? I was trying to show yeah. how it made off too personal. Well, and then I think maybe I'm not asking that deep of a question. Right. If I were the student, it's just a matter of who's going to be reviewing my information. Is it going to be five people from admissions, one from the right. athletics, one from right. somebody else? Mm -hmm. Just kind of surface level. You know, I don't want to know, you know, how many times y'all going to meet and what time you're going to go meet for lunch right. and all that stuff. Right. I just want to know who's going to be looking at it. Just point blank. Who's looking yeah. at my application? I think from an admission officer's standpoint, I think they would feel like 
don't you kind of have a better question to ask? Just don't worry about it. Yeah, like, like, <laughs> like we have our process and you were asking you to trust that we're doing our best to be fair. And is there anything you mm. want to know more about our school to help you know whether you want to, I just don't think it's a question that would make the best impression. Mm. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's really, you know, it, I don't know. There's sort of, feels, I get it. I get it's it, almost like saying like, just, what are your hiring processes in your office? Like, are you HR compliant? I don't know. That's, that's an overstatement, <laughs> but it just could come off. Like you're like the little interrogator there. I just, I don't recommend okay, it. Okay, take it away. Don't, don't do it. Don't, just don't do it. I don't know if I'm, ex- but I don't know if I'm explaining it well. I mean, I, yeah, you are. I'm just being me and I just don't want to accept it. That's all. So what, what should our listeners take away from this, Anika? This whole chapter on different and how admissions committees evaluate you. I mean, I honestly don't know because there's so many ways that anybody could be doing anything. And to your point, don't ask the question. So you just put forth your best self. And then where you're supposed to be is where you're supposed to be. Because all of these methods, I don't know how you can even begin to tackle and take away anything from that. Okay. So let me say this. A perfectly legitimate, great question for an applicant to ask is, although this is available on common data set and websites like College Data and others as well, but it's still a good question. What factors do you use to decide who you will admit and who you will not admit. Now, that is seen as a legitimate question. Okay. And that's when the schools will say things like, you know, they may say, well, you know, we look a lot at call specific essays or the interview is really, really big for us or the counselor rec is big for us. And mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And we're big on extracurricular. Mm-hmm. So that's a le- totally, ge- does that help you a little bit? Like, that's a fair question. That helps a lot because okay. that's probably what I was trying to get at okay. anyway. And okay. I was just going through the whole since we're reading the applications, why can't we just ask who's reading applications? But you're right. That's exactly what I, that's more valuable to me anyway. How about that? So, you know, there's one other thing that, and I put this in my book, admission deans, VPs of enrollments, they usually will give, of course, if you have an extreme micromanager as a boss, they may not, but they usually will give their readers quite a bit of latitude as to how they want to approach the file in, as far as the order. So this is a quote I say in my book. I said, I recently listened to four seasoned admission officers who were on a panel. They were discussing which part of the application they read first. All four of them started with something different. One started with the academic information. Another started with the family information. A third veteran just read the common app directly in the order that it prints out on, you know, or not doesn't print out, but it's on the computer. A fourth member liked to go to the school profile first. Other admissions officers like to start with the essays first. So as far as the order in which people approach the file, most of the time, that's up to the each individual. And most bosses feel like, look, as long as you read a file well and you're given ratings that aren't like way out in left field, like how you want to approach it is up to you. Mm. Is it, You know, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? That some, mm-hmm. I personally like to start with the school profile. So I like to know a little something about the school. And then I like to know more about the background information of the context of the family. I want to know different things about the family. And I'm not one of these people that like to jump right to test scores because I think you need to look at test scores in context. Uh, So I want to know the school and know that in context. And I want to know a bit about the family in context before I start getting into things like the transcript and the courses and the test scores and then even the essays. So that was just me. But it's Mm -hmm. interesting that so many different people approach it differently. Right. Got it. I mean, I think one of the takeaways I will say is if a family wants to know how you're being evaluated, or let's say a student wants to know how you're being evaluated, that does say something about how much care, time, and attention goes into handpicking out each kid and trying their best to get it right versus just number crunching. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I can agree with that. It's time for a question from one of our listeners. All right, Mark, this week's question comes from Ms. Tamara. Tamara's in Discovery Bay, California. Where in the world is that? Discovery Bay. It's interesting. You ever heard of that, Mark? It's not that far from San Francisco and oh, the really? Bay. Like in that Bay, it's in that Bay area. Oh. In like a half an hour of that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm going to read um, Tamara's email. She says, hello, Mark and Anika. First off, I love your podcast. Thank you so much. I am a proud mother of a super achieving senior. My question is, my daughter will be 16 when she graduates high school and barely turning 17, depending on when college starts. 
do you know of any special process we may need to add to her application? I'm thinking she means if there's any kind of consent that she needs to provide because she's so young. Mm -hmm. And she says early in the year when she took classes at the local community college, I had to give her consent to attend as she was not 18. Is this the same for college? Okay, so that is her actual question. Now, Mark, she actually has a couple more questions in here. I'm just going to go ahead and read her the rest of the email and I'm going to let you, you know, tear this thing apart. Okay. So the second question is also, do you have any school recommendations for a strong life science program that have small pupil to staff ratios and are in semi urban setting? She says they're on the West Coast, but she wants or her child wants to go to the East for college. And lastly, she says she just finished podcast number 76. And I want to say the highlight of University of Georgia was impressive. It would be great if you could work in information about great schools that may not be on the radar. It sparks curiosity. It really gives a perspective of value because as your listeners, we begin to trust and value your input. And thus that segment could be added as a bonus to your content. Tamara, ooh, thank you so much for all those great points. So one, two, three, Mark, how are you going to do this? Well, first of all, shout out to Mary. She's really one of our really faithful listeners and she's great at email communication with us. I'd like to. T- oh, I'm sorry. You said you say Tamara. I say Tamara. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong or incorrectly. And then as far as the life science question, let's table that because that's a whole different thing. And so let's get that. I think we have an opening on episode 96 or 97 for a question. Let's get that one on there. OK. And I do want to thank you so much for the comment about liking the call spotlights, because it really was these kind of emails that allowed us to do that. Uh, And I have to shout out my friend, Dr. David Williams, who we interviewed here. He's been telling me since probably episode 20 that we should do college spotlights on some underrated gems out there. And I said, no, Dave, no. And I had to bite my ego. And when more emails came in. (laughs) And now here you are. (laughs) When the people spoke, we had to say, let's give the people the day. Burger King, have it your way. No, (laughs) Burger King, have it your way. (laughs) So let's get to this question, though, about do I need consent? And, you know, Anika, we haven't talked about FERPA or HIPAA on our podcast. I don't, do you remember us talking about? Cause I don't remember us talking about FERPA or HIPAA in 87 episodes. I uh, know I deal with it at work though. So I'm pretty familiar with it. Yeah. yeah. So you know it, but do you deal with both FERPA and HIPAA, both of them? Well, no, 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 just FERPA, just FERPA. Okay. Cause people confuse those. So uh-huh. let me kind of touch on that because it'll give an answer to the question. So HIPAA is an acronym for Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Basically what it does, it protects privacy and medical records. And basically as soon as your child turns 18, you as a parent don't have access to their medical information, even if they're covered by health insurance. And so that means that if like your student goes to a counseling center or a health clinic or a family doctor back home, those are like confidential records and you don't automatically have access to them unless you're invited by the student. And so that's kind of how HIPAA works. And so people kind of sometimes confuse HIPAA and FERPA. Now, there are exceptions of HIPAA, of course, if you're in the emergency room and there's some different exceptions, but this isn't a whole thing about HIPAA. So let's get off of HIPAA. Now, FERPA started in 1974 as the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. And what that does is it gives parents complete control of their child's educational records and transfers that control to the student when they turn 18. So up until the time you're 18, parents have a right to those records. And when I'm talking about records, I'm talking about things like your disciplinary records, student financial information, course schedules, transcripts, grades. So what happens is when a child either turns 18 or, and this is important, either turns 18 or they go to college, then those rights transfer over to the student. Okay. So the answer to the question is you don't have to sign stuff anymore because once the child is 18 or they go to college, then the parent doesn't have to do those type of signatures. It is different if you're taking a college class and a high school class together. Okay, a lot of times they will require it. But one thing that people don't realize about FERPA is that this is going to get a little technical, but I think it's important that we explain this. So. When a student is a dependent student in college, dependent student for tax purposes, so the parent claims the student on their tax returns, okay, the college can choose to share educational records with the parent and be in compliance with FERPA. That's not a mandatory thing. 
That's an optional decision. So one of the things you want to do is go to your registrar section of the website because that's where you'll find the FERPA information. Hmm. All right. And, you know, there's more we could talk about because schools do disclose information in directories and things like that. So there are some exceptions. But the bottom line is, to answer the question, is once you either turn 18 or you are enrolled in college, then you no longer require parent signatures under FERPA. You have your own rights to educational privacy. But a college may or may not, depending on their policy, choose to share information with parents. Any questions, Anika? I want to make sure I understand that about the taxes. So if I'm a, if the kid is a dependent, yep. they're in college. I'm sorry, say that again. I, I'm just. All right. So a couple of points I made. One, if you are either 18 or enrolled in college, your FERPA rights technically transfer from the parent to the student. Right. Got that. Okay. Got that right. Mm-hmm. Now, a college may or may not make a decision to share educational records with the parent if the child is a dependent student. Mm -hmm. That's an individual policy decision and some colleges do it and some don't do it. Mm -hmm. So what I always recommend, just because, you know, sometimes this involves going down and showing on the tax return the child's a dependent and getting a release form and all that. What's easier to just do is just to use the student portal and get your child to give you access to the portal, and then you don't need to, you know, you don't have to worry about it. So that's what I do with all my kids. Right. I'm like, look, if I'm paying for this, you're going to, I'm seeing your grades. I'm sorry. <laughs> and if you don't like that, then By the way. go to McDonald's. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's not quite that cold, but I'm sorry. All right. Like, if you want yeah. me to pay, then I'm going to have access. All right. And so I just had access to the portal, and you can go into the portal and see things through the portal. That's how I dealt with it, but I know. Did I answer your question, Anika, about the tax return and about the dependency or not? Yeah, I guess the reason why I wasn't grasping is because I can't imagine a kid not being a dependent when they go off into school. But maybe there are special cases. I'm sure they're out there. Wait a minute. You weren't a dependent? Anika, remember when we did the podcast on what, what makes a dependent and what makes a non dependent? Yeah, but that was a little bit of a special case, I think. I don't know. I well, feel there like are I, special cases out there too. Yeah, I know, but I'm just, I shouldn't say I was a special case. I just feel like that was not the norm. I feel like the norm is that the kid is there in high school. Oh, off. Now you're going to college. Yeah, I'm still claiming you on your taxes at least for the next two years. I don't know. I could be wrong. About okay. So you're right as far as the norm, right? Mm-hmm. Most kids that go off to college are dependents. No question about it. Mm-hmm. But think of all the times when you may not be a dependent. Let's say you are married. You're not a dependent. Mm. Let's say you have a child and you provide more than 50% of the cost of the expenses, then you're an independent. Okay. Let's say you're 24 years old as of January 1. Remember, not everybody, remember we talked about non traditional students? Like, not everybody just goes right out of high school. That's right. That's you right. You know, let's yeah. say you're 24. Let's say you were in the armed services or veteran services. You know, let's say you are, remember the whole scandal we did about the whole custodial parent? Mm-hmm. Let's say the person has guardianship is not one of your parents. Like, there are lots of different cases where people are not dependent. Yeah. You're right. But you're right. You're right. No, you're right. <laughs> you're definitely right that most people are. So I know I took some time to answer that because I could have just simply said, you do not need to have parent consent once your child goes to college because once you're 18 or enrolled in college, FERPA rights are transferred over. And that would have been it, but I thought I'd provide a little more context. There is one more thing I want to say, because this can be confusing to people. Okay. On the comment app, it asks for a FERPA release related to your teacher recommendations. That is not all of FERPA. That is just you as a student relinquishing your FERPA rights to be able to see what your teachers actually said about you. And I strongly recommend that you sign that. And if I was a teacher, Anika, and a teacher has every right to do this, if I was a teacher, I would have a policy. I'm not doing any recommendation for a kid that does not do a FERPA release. Mm, That's pretty strong. Yeah, because one, I don't want to get sued by somebody and I want to be able to write transparently. Mm, Okay. okay. I want to be able to transparently write about a student without somebody coming behind and saying, I don't really like the way that word you use there, that sentence you use there. Mm -hmm. I don't want, I'm looking over my back. Like it's a trust relationship between me and the school. Okay. So I just want to say this because on the comment app, it asks about the FERPA release. And I want people to understand that is only you're not giving up all your FERPA rights. You're only saying you are releasing the right to be able to review the recommendations that your teachers submitted. And that is on the comment app. And I think people I don't want people to confuse that with all of FERPA. 
Right, right, yeah. Okay, friends, you know one of my former students is my interviewee. And by the way, some of you may wonder, why do we do like three and four part interviews all the time? One is because there's no way, unless this was my full-time job, I could go get 52 people and do 52 interviews. <laughs> I would need a 60-hour work week just for that. <laughs> so that's part of it. But we break it up, and we also want to do an in-depth uh, breakdown. And so this is part two. And what Tara does here is she gives us tips on how to stand out at a college fair. And she shares questions that she does not believe students should ask when they're at a college fair. And she also answers the question, should a student come to a fair with pre-printed labels or not? Is that a good thing to do or a bad thing to do? And after talking about college fairs, then we transition and we talk about admissions interviews on the road, which Tara does a lot of them on the road. And she talks about whether students should accept an interview if one is offered. Finally, Tara talks about bragging in an interview. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Listen and enjoy. And now, this week's interview with a special guest. So let's talk about college fairs. If you were speaking to a group of high school students and you were giving them advice about how to maximize their time at a college fair, what would you tell them? The first thing I would tell students to maximize their experiences at a college fair, the very first rule is don't wait in a line. There are so many amazing colleges out there and definitely meeting the reps of your top choices are important, but also try to keep an open mind and come prepared with other questions and other options. I think it's really important that students don't get bogged down in what I call name brand schools, um, schools whose names you know so well and everyone has heard about them and everyone at your school is applying to them. They are name brand for a reason. They are incredible, but there are other opportunities at other schools that are so amazing. And it's a bit heartbreaking as an admission counselor to be at a college fair, to know the amazing things that you have to offer students. And you'll have students, you know, flank either side of you for a different college. And they're asking about opportunities that you offer, but the other college doesn't. And then they walk away. (laughs) So I definitely think that it's important for students to keep a bit of an open mind. Most of the time, your high schools will have the list prepared of what colleges are going to be available. I would do a little bit of research on each of those institutions, not just the ones that you, you know, are hard and fast, you know, you're definitely going to apply, but even ones that might be a little bit outside of your radar. I would do a little more research on them and see if they might be a school that you would want to talk to. You might be surprised by what you hear and you might get more from that experience if you're talking to other colleges. Great, 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 great insight. And that's just uh, so common for people to go to the long line with a name they've heard of. And actually, they waste a lot of time because you may be in line. It's like going to Six Flags or something and you go to, you know, the <laughs> wait for the hour on the roller coaster and you can miss out on another <laughs> really good ride, you know, Absolutely. There, you know. So let's talk about some other do's and don'ts. And then also you had mentioned that I said I would bring this back, that you remember students you've met on the road mm-hmm. and that can impact when you're reading a file and you remember them because you have a sense of their personality. Were you talking about fairs? Do you remember any conversations you've had with students at fairs when it comes to file reading? Oh, of course. So I did have, I have a positive and a not so positive or rather neutral experience. So I, re- I was at one fair out in Chicago and the mother had come up to me and she was, you know, very excited, but then she looked at me with a sadder face and said that her daughter has zero interest in women's colleges and really was not looking <laughs> to even consider them. And I said, just send her over to me. We can chat for a little bit and we'll see what she says. Wonderfully, after speaking with me, the student did fill out an information card for me and grabbed a few different pamphlets. I honestly don't recall whether or not she um, decided to apply, but I do recall that experience, at least helping her think a little bit more open-minded. I answered a few questions for her that made her realize that it's not what she thought it was. (laughs) But then I've had other experiences where very recently, actually, at New Jersey Seeds, I believe. I was at a college fair of theirs and one of their students was in my essay writing workshop. 
And then she came up to me afterwards and told me how great the workshop was. She was very happy with it. And she was very interested in applying to Smith. And her application actually came through for our Women of Distinction program. And she, of course, had a wonderful application. But when it came down to that committee and figuring out who we're going to admit to the program, it was very easy for me to say, I know this application is strong. And I know the student themselves is a wonderful person that I've already interacted with. And so she was accepted to our program, which was great. And so that was that was a great experience that I had. I love it. I love it. Let's talk about some more do's and don'ts of college fairs. I know that my pet peeve, you know, when I did admissions was somebody coming up and asking me something so basic they just could have got off of the website. Yes. <laughs> and the same questions over and over and over. What are your average scores? Things like that. Mm-hmm. Do you have that same experience? Anything you want to comment on there? Yes, absolutely. So we, I do have that experience a lot. My favorite and the kind of a running joke in the office is when students say, so what's your school about? And depending on who you ask, some of us will say, well, we're about 2,700 students or we're about 50 majors. You know, it's such a general question to ask. And we obviously can't give our typical hour-long info session information at a college fair. The same thing with questions that you can easily find the answers to online, like you said, our average GPAs, or, you know, what are the kind of top choice majors that are chosen by current students, things like that, I think, aren't really getting to the heart of what you're looking for in a college experience. And I think that when students are thinking about the questions to ask when they are visiting colleges or meeting college reps at college fairs, or even having a college representative at their school, they should think about what is it that they really want from their college experience? What is it that they're looking for? What's going to kind of tip the scales to make them want to attend a school? And those are the kinds of questions they should be asking. So let's talk about some just general communication practices. So we're talking about things like eye contact and handshakes and dress, anything you want to say about any of those things and the kind of impression that they make or don't make? Absolutely. The speaking voice, you know, how people (laughs) speak monotone or whatever. Anything you want to say about that? Sure. I think that it's very important to be comfortable at your college fairs, but still look presentable. Even if if you're coming for an information session or an interview, you should always, you know, be comfortable, but presentable. Bear in mind that for some of us, that college fair experience might be the only experience we have of you in particular. And you don't want to give us a bad vibe, (laughs) right? You you want to put your best foot forward when you're meeting college representatives. And so I don't need to see a student in, you know, a three-piece suit, but I also would like to not see students in sweatpants and t-shirts. I understand that there are a lot of schools that do have athletics programs that go to late and then they are trying to meet with these college reps at fairs. But I'd rather you take the time, come in a little bit later and I'll be able to chat with you when you're not in your athletic gear than maybe speaking with a student who came right after practice and has mud on their body. (laughs) That also sounds like body odor. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, well, the funny thing is, is, and I I say this often, when I say anything that sounds silly or ridiculous, I'm only saying it because it's happened. But I think that the other thing that's important, it is important to maintain eye contact and it's important to express yourself very clearly. These college shares typically take place in a gym and there are a lot of us. So sometimes we need to hear you and we understand that projecting might be scary. You might think you're yelling at us. I promise if you are yelling, you'll see it in our faces. But most of the time we we're perfectly okay with you raising your voice so that we can hear you during the college fairs. So what are your thoughts on pre-printed labels, Tara? Some people love them, some don't. And by this, I'm talking about where maybe on a sticker, Mm -hmm. you have your name and you have your school and you have your date of birth and you have your, you know, your grade and maybe your intended major. And, and, you know, some people put GPA and test scores. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Do you like them? And then some of them put the sticker on your inquiry card and, and some people don't like them. What are your thoughts? We love them. And I love them for 
a number of reasons. I love them because they usually save us time when we're conversing. We can just talk about your experience. We can just talk about what you're looking for. We can just talk about what we're offering rather than you trying to look up and write at the same time. It's a little bit easier to have a real conversation during college fairs if you have those pre-printed labels. The other thing, and this is speaking from my time helping with data entry and processing when I was at Muhlenberg, it's really nice to not have to decipher handwriting. Mm -hmm. Um, It's very, very helpful for our data entry team if they have those printed labels. It's a lot easier to get through. And even if you aren't able to print something out, if you don't have access to a printer or to labels, that's perfectly fine. Even if you have tape and a card that has, you know, some of your information already written down. I've had students tape little index cards with their information. That's also helpful to anything that maximizes your face time with us. It's really, really great. I'm really glad you said that because I wasn't trying to reveal my bias, but I loved <laughs> pre-printed labels when I did fairs and traveled all around. And for all the reasons that you said, you know, one, maximizing the face time, legibility, And then, you know, there's a certain kind of etiquette at a fair. Like you can't stay in front of the table forever, especially if there are a lot of people behind you. Mm -hmm. You have a certain amount of time and then you kind of need to move on. So do you really want to spend that lot of that time, you know, filling out a card and doing all that? And so the only thing that I will say is that there are some schools that have particular unique questions on their Mm -hmm. on their card. Mm -hmm. So when you stick the label on it, it is good to look to make sure that your label answered all the things. And if it doesn't, you could just maybe feel that one, like still have a pen Absolutely. in case they, yeah, to put in that one thing. And those are the the only times I've talked to admission officers and they haven't liked the pre-printed labels is when they kind of, well, sometimes people just come up and slap a label on, don't talk at all and move on and don't engage. <laughs> like we're not talking about that, right? right? No, no, no. Definitely have a conversation with us if you're going to fill out a card with us. You know what I'm going to do in the show notes of this podcast? I'll put the things that I recommend that people put on a pre-printed label. So if you go into the show notes, if you have all these things on, you'll pretty much cover your bases more than 95% of the time will be the main clean out questions that schools like. So we'll put that in the show notes because I'm sure someone's thinking, well, what do I put on it? So so, uh, rather than get into that now, let's do that. So one other thing I want to ask you about around fairs, what are your thoughts about students following up afterward with either an email thank you or a handwritten card or additional question by email. What are your thoughts on that, Tara? They're really nice to receive. It's nice to be seen. And I get that feeling from being a student through this college process. It was nice to be recognized during the college process by the admission officers that were working on my behalf. But as a college representative, it's also really nice to be recognized. (laughs) And so there are times when I've gotten follow-up emails from students, not only thanking me for my time, but even asking another question that they forgot to ask. And I think that that's really important is if we're there, and especially if we're handing out cards You might not have a question for me at that instant, but you'll be able to have my information and you'll be able to ask that question at another time. So I think it's really nice to reach out after the fair is over. If you have a question or if you would like to, I don't think it's necessarily kind of a tipping the scales situation. I know that for some institutions, you know, calculating demonstrated interest is part of what they do. We don't do that at Smith. So it's nice and it adds a little bit of a personal touch and it helps you to be a little bit more memorable throughout our entire admission process. But I wouldn't require it if, if that was, you know, if it, if it required you. Yeah. Right. No, I'm glad you brought that up because you don't, you don't want people feeling like they need to just do it just to score brownie right. points. Exactly. Kind of thing, is what you're saying. I will say this too, like, you know, you're at a, December Seven Sister School, Selective Liberal Arts School with a pretty large admission office compared to the number of applications you get. Mm -hmm. And liberal arts colleges in general are much more receptive to sort of building rapport with their students in that versus like a large public university, which, you know, if you look at the ratio of admission officers to applications, there's no comparison to what you guys have. And in those cases, it may not be as noticed just because they just may be overwhelmed by volume. Sure, absolutely. I mean, I still wouldn't be a bad idea to do it, but it won't necessarily get as much 
you know, individual attention. I don't know if you'd agree with that, but that's my take. <laughs> no, I agree with you. I think that it's it's definitely something that we'll notice because we have a, a smaller number than those really big universities. And everything you do is forming an impression, right? It's forming an impression of, of who you are as you're trying to understand this person. Yeah. And, you know, so so that's great. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. We have quite a few emails asking us to discuss the athletic recruiting process in some detail. And we will have a multi-part interview in 2020 to discuss athletic recruiting. But if you really want a lot of information on this topic, and you don't want to wait nine months for us to cover athletic recruiting on our podcast, there are over 150 episodes about athletic recruiting in the Recruit Me Athletic Scholarship Podcast. And most of the episodes are very, very short, only like 15 minutes. This podcast is full of a wealth of information if you're serious about playing college sports or if you are trying to get an athletic scholarship. Personally, I've listened to quite a few of the episodes, and Fugler knows his stuff. One thing I appreciate is his emphasis on how you as the athlete need to be an initiator. If you listen, you will frequently hear John Fugler say, action produces traction. John Fugler himself was a walk-on Division I athlete, but both of his kids got athletic scholarships, and he has devoted himself to teaching others how to get athletic scholarships ever since 2002 when he started recruiting. Fugler is also the author of our second recommended resource of the week, The Athletic Scholarship Playbook, which I'm also recommending. So for this week, you get two recommended resources, the Recruit Me Athletic Scholarship Podcast and the Athletic Scholarship Playbook, which you can get on Amazon. It is available by Kindle, by paperback, or as an audiobook. Let's transition to interviews now, Tara, because you are a school that does interviews, and I know you do interviews, and I know I've talked to you with you, and you had to go do some interviews. <laughs> and so, yes. <laughs> and obviously, not everybody does interviews. And so, I guess in general, let me just throw it out open endedly. What would you like to say about interviews? Do you recommend a student request an interview with you if you're on the road or not? So, I, it varies you know, how colleges organize interviews during travel season varies by college and varies by counselor. I try to make sure that I have some time during my travel season in every territory where I can set time aside for students to interview with me. And I'll usually send an email out to anyone who is in our database from that area who maybe hasn't submitted any information yet. I try to send them a link to sign up for an interview with me if they're interested in interviewing. I think interviewing is great for a number of reasons. First of all, it's a great way for us to get to know you. It's a great way to make a lasting impression on the admission counselor. It's a great way to get your particular questions answered. And I think that that's another thing that students need to keep in mind is, yes, the interview can be qualitative. And yes, we will be taking notes at some point on how the interview went and the kind of how we figured how you would fare on our campus. But I also think it's important for students to recognize that this is a chance for them to get questions answered that are very particular to their experience. You might not want to ask a particular question during an info session or even in the middle of a college fair with so many people around. During the interview, you have that opportunity. It's a one-on-one time to get that question answered. We also have alum all over the world who give interviews for us. And so they can speak on the Smith experience, which is something that is unique. And you can have that particular question answered too. What was it like for them to live in this particular house and live on this campus for four years? And what was their experience with their professors? Not all of our admission officers are able to speak on the Smith experience, though we do have quite a few alum who work in our office. But for those of us who are an alum, you know, it's still important for you to be able to get other particular questions answered. So when I send out that email, as I said, I do try to make sure that I schedule time in all of my territories to have a space to interview with students, especially when I know I'm in an area where students may not be able to easily get to Smith College. If I'm out in Chicago, not everyone can grab a flight over to Massachusetts. That's fantastic. Now, there are two schools of thought out here. I want to know which one you 
would identify more. Some people feel like some people feel like if you're not a very good interviewer, then don't interview because it's probably going to make a negative impression. And then others feel as if interviews are rarely going to hurt you. Sure, if you're like extremely diffident and non-communicative, it could hurt you. But for the most part, if you prepare for it, it's only either going to be a neutral factor or help you. You know, which of those would you say, or maybe you have another perspective, but what are your thoughts on that of those two camps? I would lean more towards the latter. I don't think that an interview can necessarily hurt you unless you are in an extreme, give us a negative interview. But I do think that whether or not you interview well, part of it has to do with the person who's giving the interview. Mm. We try really hard to make sure that students feel as comfortable as possible. I did have a student earlier today, actually, who was in an interview with me and she looked a little nervous and I asked her if she wanted to take a few breaths before we, you know, proceeded with the interview. And I think it's the job of the interviewer to make sure that the interviewee feels more comfortable, especially during this college application process. Of course, we understand that students are going to be nervous. I think anyone in an interview is nervous, no matter how much interview experience you might have. And so, I think that students should really, if if they have the opportunity to have an interview with a college representative, I definitely think they should take it. Like I said, unless they are extreme in a negative sense, there's really no harm in having that interview. You know, I was listening to this other admission officer share this story. And I, I, now this never happened to me. And I, you know, I did zillions of interviews, but they're interviewing an applicant like in a hotel lobby. Mm -hmm. And the person was like, you know, painfully nervous. And then all of a sudden they just like barfed, they ralphed all over the admission officer. Yes. They had to go and change. (laughs) Yes. And they just got so nervous. And then it was in the hotel lobby. So, you know, where she was staying. So she went up and changed her clothes. And then the person said later, like, I still would like to finish if you don't mind. And do you know that they finished the interview and that admission officer admired her for like persevering and actually They ended up accepting the kid. I mean, obviously, (laughs) it's not only based on the interview, but I thought, wow, what a story (laughs) about nerves. That's definitely amazing. Wow. That never happened. I'm I'm glad I never had that experience. (laughs) Yes. No, that's an extreme. But again, you know, I agree with the admission counselor, though. The kid showed some gusto and and bravery and being able to say, you know, I know that I did this horrible thing, but I would like to try to continue our conversation. I think that's wonderful. Probably it was a good thing she was in her hotel room, not like on the road yes, somewhere. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> on her new dress. So so <laughs> let's talk about how a student can prepare for an interview. What's your advice? Oh, preparing for an interview. Kind of similar to I think the college fairs, although maybe a little more in-depth work. But again, first things first, even though what you dress like and how you present yourself is not going to be the thing that makes us decide whether or not you'll be accepted. But I do think that making sure that you are presentable and comfortable is very important. It's great if you come in a three-piece suit, if that's really what you want to do, but at least be comfortable in that three-piece suit. If you're fidgeting a lot, obviously that'll give us some questions about why you would choose to come in something that you're not comfortable in. So I think that being comfortable, um, but still presentable is really important. And then be prepared for some questions that you might have to think about. We typically start off with some easier questions. Where are you from? What are you studying this year? But then we get into questions that dig a little bit more deeply into what you're looking for and who you are as a person. Just as you're trying to find the right fit for you, we're trying to find students that fit kind of our community as well. And so I think it's important for students to maybe take a little bit of time, look up interview questions, college interview questions. They may not be specific to the college, but some of those general questions might be similar and it might give allow the students to kind of get some insight into themselves before they even get to the interview. I would tell students, don't be afraid to brag. Try not to be overly braggy, but (laughs) don't be afraid to be proud of the accomplishments that you've achieved at this point in your life because you definitely have achieved some. And I would, of course, do research on the institution. I would hope that if a student is sitting in an interview with me, they're not surprised when I ask them how they feel about us being a women's college. You know, it's things like that, I think, are important. Just 
make sure that you've done some homework so that when it comes time to ask us questions, you have questions that, again, are thoughtful and are telling of what you're looking for in your college experience and help us envision you on this campus. So you said a lot in there. I want to unpack it. I hope our <laughs> listeners didn't miss it. No, it was great. It was great. One of the things that you said is make sure you have questions for us because at every interview, pretty much there's going to be an opportunity to say, what questions do you have for me? And if you don't have any, this doesn't come off with a good vibe. You either present yourself like you didn't prepare or that you're not inquisitive. Right. So I like that you commented on that. And the other thing I really liked is, you know, admission officers can tell when someone's done Absolutely. their homework, right? And when I do interview prep, that's the biggest weakness I see, you know, with students. I did an interview prep session recently and the student was looking at a school in Massachusetts. And I said, so tell me what you know about us. And they're like, they paused for a long time and they're like, you're in oh, Boston, no. you know, <laughs> like, like you got to give me more, you know? <laughs> you know, so, so yeah, the preparation comes really, really, really important. And I, the other thing I said, which you loved was the, the bragging thing. That's actually important. Like, obviously, you know, we're told not to brag. So that kind of people recoil and bristle when they hear that word. Mm -hmm. But if you have confidence in yourself, then it'll give us confidence in you to some extent. Oh, absolutely. You know, have a great story have a great story on this one. And this was, uh, this was on the boarding school side, but it's still the exact same thing. And so uh, a student had their interview for a boarding school. Mm -hmm. And um, this is not that long ago, because, you know, I do boarding school placement and college placement still. And I could hear the interview through the wall. And, and it's funny, because I knew this student, I knew she was extremely modest. Mm -hmm. And I'd even told her about this before, like, say what you're good at and with confidence. And I could, she was being really, really, really modest. Like, you know, one point the interviewer said, so how have you done in school? And she was like, A's and B's. Okay. And this is a school, like she had one A minus in her four years. She says A or B plus. And she's oh, like goodness. A's and B's. <laughs> and then she never talked about all these incredible things she'd done on the summer and all these international experiences. She didn't bring up any of that. And then in the boarding school process, which is a little different than the college process, sometimes the parent also has an interview. Mm -hmm. So then the parent went in, had the parent interview, and the parent brought out all these incredible things. So then later, I was meeting with the admission representative when I wanted to said, how'd the interview go? And he was like, well, you know, the student was okay. She didn't wow me. Then I started talking to the parent. And she started, the parents are telling me all these amazing things the student did. And I was wondering, why didn't the student tell me this? And, and I was <laughs> exactly. kind of trying to defend the student a little bit. I said, well, you know, she's just a little bit on the modest side. And then he said to me, it's an interview. She's supposed to brag. <laughs> and so I share that story with people. <laughs> I tell that story with people. But so I think that was really great. I loved all those little anecdotes that you that you included there. Next week in the news, Fed says student debt has hurt the U.S. housing market. And we'll be in Chapter 88 of 171 Answers. And we're answering the question, if colleges evaluate the high school that your child attends. And next week's question is from a mom who wants to know how bright students who are not the valedictorians and sports superstars of their schools, how they can stand out to the most respected colleges and universities. And Mark will be in the third part of his interview with Ms. Tara. and the work calendar of an admissions officer. Okay, Anika and friends, I'm talking about one of my favorite colleges, Occidental College, also known affectionately as Oxy. Now, I don't know if you know this, Anika, but Karis seriously considered Oxy. Hmm. We took a uh, trip to Los Angeles between 10th and 11th grade. I thought it was a fantastic visit. And it was one of those visits where I had to remind myself that this is Kara's decision and not mine because I wanted to go. <laughs> I wanted to go. And she was like, not in the top three <laughs> in the end. That's why I had to be like to tell myself, okay, you can't tell all your students that it's the student's decision, not yours, and not apply it to yourself, Mark. Back off. <laughs> I had to go through that. I met with their senior associate dean, Maricela Martinez, when I was in California seven weeks ago to learn more about Occidental. But the campus is stunning. No. Uh, many of you know Barack Obama went to Oxy after he left Hawaii. <laughs> yes, it's one of right, the Mark. very few liberal arts <laughs> and science colleges that is in a city right in Los Angeles, eight miles north of downtown. Founded in 1887 by Presbyterian ministers who came from Princeton. 
So that explains why their colors are orange and black and why their nickname is the Tigers, just like Princeton. Uh, 2,100 students, 18 is the medium class size. So like a lot of liberal arts and science classes, they keep the classes really small. 65% of students are out of state, 10% international. And I'm going to answer your question, Anika, like you asked me last week when we talked about Case Western Reserve, how selective are they? 37% acceptance rate. But as I said last week, test scores actually give you a better, you know, sense of selectivity, even than acceptance rates, because some schools are self-selective. So for Oxy, you're going to find about 30 in the mid 30s or so are going to have SATs in the 700s. You know, 50, 55% will be in the 600s and about 10% really are in the 500, just to give you a sense of that. And for an ACT, it's almost an equal division between people between a 30 and a 36 and a 24 and a 29. It's almost half and half there with the really small percent, like one or two would be 23 or under on an ACT. 37% acceptance rate, 48% white, 21% Asian, 12% Latinx, 9% black, 10% in international and 12% would be first generation. So a few more things about Oxy. General education requirements, they believe in depth and breadth. And this is a school actually, Anika, that loves it when students come in undecided. They say most of their students come in undecided and they actually like that because they want them to explore and figure out once they're there by taking a bunch of courses uh, what they're actually interested in. No classes are taught by teaching assistants and none are taught by grad assistants, only full professors. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the mayor of Los Angeles will come by and teach and a lot of other political leaders will come by and teach. Film is popular there and it's a big Hollywood place to film a lot of movies. So they have two to three films a month on their campus. And one thing that's really cool is one of their policies Mm -hmm. they have with Hollywood is if you are going to have a film on our campus, then you're going to use our students in your film. So I think that's pretty cool. They have some real signature programs. And one of the real reasons we were there is because Karis was pretty sure she wanted to major in international relations. And there's such a powerhouse program for that. (laughs) That Their signature program is their Kahane United Nations program. This is a world-renowned signature program. What happens is you get to go to, to the UN in New York and have a semester at the UN, which is totally cool. So that's their flagship program where you go to New York City for a whole semester and you're actually working at the UN, which I think is totally, totally cool. And you're exposed to all the different agencies at the UN when you go there. Lots of high level internships there. Another thing that they do, which is really cool, is they kind of try to bring the UN to Oxy as well. So they have a number of things on their campus from United Nations Week in February every year to learning about the UN through culture and cuisine. It's like a dinner series with on-campus events and speakers and workshops and multimedia presentations. So they bring the UN to Oxy and then you go to semester and it's not easy to get into the UN. You can imagine how hard it is to get in there. So you can imagine all the connections you make and how that type of networking and internships leads to jobs. So that's a signature program. Another signature program is their campaign semester. This started in 2008. And so every two years, what happens here is that Occidental students, they get involved in political campaigns and everything you can imagine about running a campaign, working on a campaign, and they get academic credit for working on a political campaign. And this is something that you don't just have to be like a political science major to do. It's open to anybody of all majors, whether you have campaign experience or not. And this could be like a presidential campaign, a Senate campaign, a House campaign, a gubernatorial campaign. But basically for the first 10 weeks of the fall semester, You are like away from campus involved in a campaign, running a campaign or working on a campaign. So you can imagine people that are interested in a career in politics, that could be pretty exciting. A third signature program for them is their undergraduate research that they do. And so they do all kinds of cutting edge scholarship and research through their URC or their undergraduate research center. And that can be anything from, you know, website and newsletters and Uh, student presentations and research conferences and uh, independent researches and summer research and national travel research and 10-week mentored research, but working with community scholars. So research, research, they're a huge research school. And then the last thing to emphasize is sort of a key distinctive would be their senior comprehensives that they just call senior comps. And basically the senior comps 
what you do here is like independent studies. And it's like a senior level thesis that you do. And they're, they're known for these senior level theses. So it involves field research projects. It could be creative works. It could be art exhibitions. But it's deep intellectual stuff that you're doing. And they have been recognized as being one of the leading schools to go to for senior capstone research type projects. And, 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 you know, Princeton is known for their theses that everybody does, right? So you would expect that people from Princeton coming over, starting it, would do something similar where they have a, a senior thesis that you need to do to graduate. And I want to read something in closing from their website and then see if you have any thoughts on anything I said, Anika. This is from their website. It says, distinctly oxy. Our graduates are strategic thinkers, effective communicators, uncommonly inclusive, consciously collaborative. Our students seek to embrace difference, make a difference in the world. Occidental is reinventing the liberal arts and sciences for a new generation of problem solvers, creators, and thinkers. Any thoughts? I think those signature programs are off the charts. <laughs> and the fact that it's in no, they really are. LA, I've never been to LA. So that in itself is fascinating. Really? Mm-hmm. We got to get you to LA. Yeah, we do. <laughs> get me you there, know what, Mark. I mean, one, of times, one of these times we have to do one of these live events, that, you know, with we travel and go out and meet our listeners. Because, you know, Cal- mm-hmm. our latest stats, we have three times as many listeners in California as the next state. I know this Cali has been popping up a lot. Yeah. So that would be cool. Let's do that. That would be fun. I'd love to get you to LA. All right. So Gold Oxy is pretty small, 2,100 students. That's, I mean, it's similar to Davidson size. You know, you know, those are art colleges. They try Mm -hmm. to keep the classes small and, right. And that. So I would have been more than happy for Kirsten to go there, but she went, I don't think so. And it's (laughs) student driving the ship in this process. Could you share what she didn't like about it? Like, what was one thing? It was just the feeling. And I was so surprised because every other school I visited with Karis, Mm -hmm. like, I know her well enough. I'm like, oh, she's going to just love this school. Mm, She's not feeling it. Mm. And that one, she just couldn't articulate it. I just Mm. thought it was, like, amazing. That's interesting. But it's not like, what's that? You know that term they use? I better not take my chances. Remember last week when I messed up on my vocab? (laughs) I can't remember, remember but that? I like, you messing up. <laughs> oh, I messed up badly. Oh, was it the shade and the... Uh, yeah, gosh, I said shine and shade. Bad. I said, isn't shine bad? <laughs> so I'm I'm going to risk stepping into contemporary world again here. Oh my you, know how they, you know how people say, ah, oh, it was just meh. It was just meh. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. heard that? Mm-hmm. So Karis just had a, like, it, it was like, it was meh. I was like, <laughs> what are you talking about? This place is amazing. <laughs> Can I go? Can I be 18 again? Negative. On to Davidson and graduate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what? Karis hadn't even got to the campus at Davidson. She just got into the little town. You know that you go around that little that mm-hmm. little roundabout mm-hmm. there where they have like the sushi places and all that. And she was she was sold. She was done. She was like, I just know I'm gonna want to come to the school. I'm like, we haven't no. got to campus yet. <laughs> <laughs> and she <laughs> and did. they just got better and better from there. So. Hey, Aww. Davidson is amazing, too. So I cannot complain. Two phenomenal schools. Right. All right, Anika, anything going on this week? Uh, Lots and lots of work at work. Ooh-wee. It's going to be something else. So I'll try to be rested up by the time we come back. Yeah, I have a 3,500-person college fair. 3,500. And parents can't even come. 3,500 students. Wow. It's, mm. yeah, the Kip Love at Westminster Fair is this Saturday. And so I will be there all day on Saturday, you know, as a volunteer. Usually I sit in like the info sessions and walk the reps to their tables and do all that stuff. So that's where I'll be college fair bound. So let's record next Sunday. Have a good week. All right. Good luck with that. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. And if you found this podcast helpful, it would help us tremendously if you would subscribe and write us a review on your favorite podcast listening station. And please be sure to click the share button and send this to someone you know that could really use this information. Your College Bound Kid is produced by John Lockenball. The amazing music that you hear is by Victor Allen Weeks. Artwork is by Andrea Togo. And marketing designs are by Kimberly Blass. If you want to get a copy of the book, 171 Answers to the Most Asked College Admissions Questions, you can go right to 171answers.com. And if you want to have a college coaching session with Mark, you can send him a text to area code 
888-789-4340. And if you have a question or a few questions that you would like for us to answer on the show, please email us at questions at yourcollegeboundkid.com. That's questions with an S at yourcollegeboundkid.com. Every week, we'll take one question and include it in the episode. We don't like your questions. We love your questions. So send them our way. And by the way, check out our website, which is just simply yourcollegeboundkid.com. Again, we thank you for tuning in and we look forward to meeting with you again next week.